Psalm 19. Have you had that experience yet in your life? It could be your salvation experience. It could be uh, where you, quote, unquote, got serious about serving the Lord, following the Lord, and as such. I guarantee you that if you uh, will seek the Lord, sooner or later you will have a spirit, an experience along those lines. That song, of course, is referring to the burning bush experience in Moses' life. Moses was on, the Bible says, the backside of the desert. He might not have even been aware, but he was running from God. He was absolutely doing his own thing. Found him a wife. He was a shepherd. He was living his life. It would be like me uh, going to Texas and getting a few cows and trying to do my best to make my mark on the cattle industry, which is a fleshly desire, if you will, that I have. Just doing my thing. And look and see, and there's a hay bale on fire. And it's not being consumed. Now, anybody that knows anything about hay and fire knows that it's going to burn up. And if it's not burning up, someone is involved. And can you imagine a bush in the desert that is burning and not being consumed? Moses goes, I believe I'm going to turn aside and see what's going on. And as he approaches the song that Brother Dale sang, happened. Take off your shoes, Moses, for the ground on which you stand is holy. And the reason the ground that he stood was holy was because God had inhabited, if you will, that ground, and he wanted to talk to Moses. Now, this is what every one of you need to realize. God wants to talk to you, too, on a daily basis. And in some cases, he will have a burning bush experience with you, meaning I've got something very specific I need and want you to do now. And I've had some of those. For me, it was, and this is just one, of a few, if you will, but I had a burning pew experience at, uh, it'll come to me, Lynchview. Why would anyone call a church Lynchview? But nonetheless, well, it was because it was on Lynchview Drive, but Lynchview Baptist Church. And on that pew, I was praying about you. I was asking God, do you want me to come to Lonedale? Do you want Ben Kingston to go to Lonedale, and that would have been in 1987. And on that pew, the Holy Spirit made it extremely clear. I had brought books with me. I had brought the Word of God with me, and never done this since, but he specifically directed me to specific pages in each book and in God's Word, and he spoke to me through those books and through God's Word. Every fear that I had, he alleviated. Every question that I had, what, what will I do? He showed me and the such. It was a burning bush experience. Church, please hear me. The people that God wants to hear this message are here today. It's you. You are here today to hear this message. God is speaking. Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. Will you stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word? I've shared with you before that Chauncey Clay shared this passage by memory at every funeral I ever heard him do, and I heard him do a few. Chauncey Clay uh, lived into his 80s and was preaching all through those years type deal, and bunches and bunches of old people asked him to do their funeral. And many of those folks I had a connection to through this church or whatever the case may be. So I've probably heard at least 8 to 12, maybe 15 Chauncey Clay funeral sermons, all of them tremendous. Watch this. He started every one of them with this. And I don't know if you've ever heard Chauncey Clay speak. Of course, he's in heaven now too. He had a high voice. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O oh God. And that's how he did it. My rock. My Redeemer. Now, Chauncey was 
uh, an African American, if you did not know that. And it was thrilling to hear him give that punctuation to that passage. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Now, one of the uh, desires that I have for you, I did not quiz the first service. I doubt that I will quiz you, but I would love for you to have this verse memorized by the end of the service because it will absolutely impact you if you will allow it to. Psalm chapter 19 Verse 14, I don't, here we go, I've got it turned there now. You ready? Let's read it together. I'm going to read it, you're going to (laughs) listen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Father, we ask you to do thy will to give thy blessings to the reading and preaching of your holy word. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. Simple title is How to Live a Life Pleasing to God. How to Live a Life Pleasing to God. Now, I'm going to attempt to confuse you, so stay with me. Get on the train with me. In my humble opinion, this verse is in ascending order. In other words, it starts with the end result, and you have to work backwards to see how you get to the end result. And... So the ending of this verse is the starting of knowing how to please God, and the end of this verse is the end result of pleasing God. So we're going to start, if you will, at the beginning, which in the verse is at the end. If you're not thoroughly confused, I have not accomplished what I was working towards. Thank you. First service, never got them on the train. Never. Sermon in a sentence would be, This verse can be a daily tool in accomplishing 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whatsoever you do, do all to the honor and glory of God. To live a life acceptable unto God, point number one, you have to have a prayer of desperation. Oh, God, he would emphasize that. Oh, God. And I didn't catch it at first, to be honest with you. My first thought was, oh, that's interesting. And as I would meditate on this, and as I I made this a verse, if you will, a life verse in my own life, I put it on my lock screen so much so that a guy noticed it, and he said, wow, that's a good idea. Yeah, because I need all the reminders I can get. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto thee, O God, my rock and my redeemer. So why is it a prayer of desperation? Why the, O God, why are we in desperation? How well do you know yourself? How honest are you with yourself? And church, please hear me. I'm not trying to get onto anybody. And I've got to say, I am impressed with your humility. I am impressed. I, I can't really point to a single person in this church that has tried to rationalize their humanity. There's nobody in this church that I know of personally that tries to, to if you will, Prove their righteousness. I don't, I don't know of any Pharisees or Sadducees in this church. Praise God. Most of the time, if not all the time, it's, man, Brother Ben, I struggle. A- Amen. I'm good with that. Watch this. It's when you quit struggling that we've got a problem. Oh, God, you and I need to be honest with ourselves. And that brings desperation. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is desperately wicked above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Let me read that right this time. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If you and I are left to our own devices, to our own dreams, to our own motivations, to our own flesh, we are in a desperate situation. We are in a desolate place. As Proverbs says in another passage that I read this week, a young man was being uh, seduced by the adulteress, and the Proverbs said he knows not. going in blind he's just he's just going he's following his lust to his death you and i every morning 
need to cry out to God in desperation for Him to move on our behalf for His name's sake. And yes, we need to crucify our flesh so that we can live a holy life that day for His will, for His glory. Do you remember the dominant spirit? The only way for you and I to live a life pleasing to God is to make sure that our spirit that has been rejuvenated through the finished work of Christ on the cross is connected to God's spirit and it tells our flesh and our body what it's going to do. When you and I get that reversed, we're in trouble. Not only are you and I to cry out in desperation to God, we are to cry out to him as our redeemer. So, so you start, remember we're starting at the end of that I'm sorry, we're starting, yeah, I had that right. We're starting at the end of the verse, but this needs to be, to be the beginning of your day. You're going to cry out in desperation to God because we are in a desperate situation because of our sinful nature. But who are we going to cry out to? My Redeemer. I love this. This is a pronunciation of gratefulness. Oh, God, my rock, my Redeemer. There's only one way that you and I have hope to escape our deceitful heart. There's only one way that you and I have an escape from going the ways of death, and that is because of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross. Without that, you and I are hopelessly lost. We are completely undone. We are void of anything internally effective. It's Jesus and Jesus alone that you and I can live a life that would bring glory to God the one and only true God. You know, I've shared with you in the past that leading up to college life, I thought I was a pretty good old boy. You know why? Because I wasn't allowed to do anything as a young man. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere without mom and dad present, so I didn't do anything, quote, unquote, wrong. I got to college. Now, y'all have heard this before. I love the phrase, I'll... I'll just indiscriminately shout it every once in a while because I love it. Freedom! Yeah, did I wake you up? Freedom! And I got to college, and, buddy, I had freedom. I didn't have a car for two years, but I, I had freedom. I couldn't go very far, but I had freedom. I was free to go and walk as far as I wanted to walk. And I did. And I discovered Brother Ben isn't near as innocent as I thought I was. I got tempted by some things that I never thought I'd be tempted by. I thought some things that I never thought I'd think. And before you know it, I, man, Lord, help, God. Left to my own devices, I'm going to make some horrible decisions. I'm going to do some horrible things. That's why he saved me. That's why he saved me. You see, he's my redeemer. It is by Jesus and Jesus alone if I do anything positive or eternally effective. Not only are you and I to cry out in desperation of gratefulness to our Redeemer, but we are to cry out in faith to our sustainer. Point number three, he is our rock. Jesus is not only our Redeemer because of his finished work on the cross, but he's also our sustainer. He is our keeper. He is our daily hope. Victory is I'm sorry, he is our conqueror. He is our minute-by-minute -minute Savior so that you and I can accomplish what God has for us on that very day. You see, this is another passage that he taught me in college. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You must believe that God is that saving faith but you also must believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You see, one of the reasons why some folks do not quote-unquote live for the Lord is because they have allowed themselves to become convinced that there's more, if you will, fruitfulness in this world. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth. This world has nothing to offer us but death, loss. What, what does the Bible say that the devil came? The devil came but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's come to destroy you. There is no promise in this world. The promise is in Jesus and in the next world. Without faith, 
it's impossible to please him. So you and I have to cry out in desperation to our Redeemer and to our Sustainer. That, my friend, is saving faith and sustaining faith. He will reward you as you seek him. You see, he is your Redeemer in that he saved you once and for all. You don't have to come back to this on a daily basis and hope that you are saved. It's not a hope so salvation. It's a K-N-O-W salvation, a no-so salvation. But we have daily needs. Can I get a witness? We have daily challenges. We have daily temptations. We have daily problems. And this, my friend, is where your rock comes into play. He will sustain you in those challenges. He will keep you from those temptations. He will answer the problems. He will be your everything if you will give him everything. And church, let's be honest. He's all we have. He's all we have. You see, my job can be lost tomorrow. My health can be gone tonight. My wife can perish tomorrow. My children could be gone in a blink of an eye. And I'm describing Job's experience. My wealth could be wasted in mere days. My friends could forsake me. There's only one entity that is a forever surety, and his name is Jesus. And that's the hope you have, too. It's the absolute hope that every person in this building that knows Jesus Christ as their Savior has today. So what is the result of crying out in desperation to your Redeemer and to your Sustainer? It is the proper meditations of the heart. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. So see, that's the end result. Be acceptable unto thee. O oh God, desperation, my Savior and my rock. Well, so what is the end result? This is point number four, the meditations of my heart. So this is the ask. The ask from your God, who is your redeemer and your sustainer, is that the meditations of your heart would be acceptable unto him. So this begs the question, what are acceptable meditations to God? Well, A, under the point number four, is content of our meditations. This is what... Our meditations are supposed to be on. Mark 12, 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Simply put, the content of your meditations should be God and everything that that involves and others. Now, we've hit on this quite a bit, especially in our serving revolution, and that is to esteem others' needs greater than your own. There's only one way that you and I are going to accomplish that, and that is if we truly do love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we daily ask him to help us to love the things, and more importantly, the people that he loves. Church, I reminded First service this morning as we left. Are you praying for God to add to this fellowship? Are you asking God to bring people during the invitation? Are you asking God to fill the baptistry? Are you asking God to help us as a church to disciple new people in Christ? You see, the scripture says you have not because you ask not. We have no one to blame but ourselves, if you will, if we're not growing. I'm not, I'm not telling you that we're not growing. I'm telling you that it behooves every one of us every day, every week, every Sunday for sure to ask God to bring the people that he wants us to reach. It behooves us to go get them because one of the meditations of our heart is supposed to be our neighbors, our relatives, and the people within our sphere of influence. I had a conversation yesterday with a family that has come and checked us out. The only reason I talked to them is because the Holy Spirit said, they need to know that you're interested. They need to know that you, as Bethel Baptist Church, want them to consider you as a home church. Church, shame on us if we assume that they assume that we want them. 
They ought to be able to say, well, I know they want us because they, they bugged the fire out of us. Yeah, type thing. I'm not telling you we should bug the fire out of them. I'm telling you that we should make sure that they know, man, we want you to consider us. We're praying that you'll find a home church, and we're praying that it's Bethel type deal. We, the meditations of our heart needs to be on the needs of other people. Church, the word of God is needed by every person in Franklin County. And this church tries to disseminate the word of God through Sunday school, through Awana, through preaching, and the such. B, the intensity of our meditations. Acts 12, 5, you, you know this, the maximum prayer effort. When Peter was uh, arrested, when Peter was arrested and it looked like they were going to kill Peter, the church got together in Rhoda's house and they prayed to the point of the stretching of their ligaments. They physically got involved in their prayer. I'm curious, church. How many times does Brother Ben's prayer time look like that? How many times am I seeking God with everything I have? Intensity is so important. I love this one. See, frequency. Frequency. It needs to happen pretty often. We talk about quiet times. Are we doing it? And then the argument, well, brother, I don't get up early enough. But, but do you stay up late enough? Can you have one in the evening? Now, yeah. David said, I'm talking about the psalmist, David. Early will I seek thee. My soul longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I don't know, though, that we can take that verse and say, it's got to be in the morning. I don't know that we can say that. Watch this. It's got to happen within a 24-hour period. Set aside some time. Frequency. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, You should teach them diligently to your children. And he's talking about the statutes of God. And you shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You should find them Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they should be as frontlets between your eyes, and you should write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So what is that? That's frequency. You're keeping God's word and, and the intensity of God's word and the content of God's word in front of you every day, all day. As a result of a cry of desperation to your Redeemer and Sustainer that your meditations would be acceptable unto God, unto God, can only result in words that do the same. Five, the words of my mouth. What goes into someone's mouth, Jesus says, does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Don't you see, Jesus said, that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. So this verse teaches us, shows us the way, how to make sure that our words please a holy God. To live a life pleasing, acceptable unto God. We have to cry out in desperation to our Redeemer our sustainer that the meditations of our heart would be on him continually and as a result our words will bring glory and honor to him one of the saddest experiences that this pastor has ever had in relation to this church is when a member of this church came to me and said brother Ben I would have and we would have a stronger witness at where I work if it wasn't for brother so-and-so. I'm like, well, you're going to have to help me because I don't know what you're trying to tell me. Now, brother so-and-so is at our church. Every time the doors open, this was years and years ago. And everybody knows that he goes to Bethel Baptist Church. He cusses. He reacts with emotion. He gets on to people for no good reason. Most of the people at work do not have anything nice to say about him. 
And I told this person, I said, well, according to Scripture, you're the one that's seeing it. For me to go to him, I'm taking your word for it. Church, I'm telling you, that's a dangerous thing to do. Can I get a witness? Do any of you want me coming to you based on what somebody else says? No. You want them to come to you. Isn't that what the scripture says? When you have an issue or a fault, you go to them. Now, that's a whole nother sermon. Still, the reality was is that this person thought everything was cool because he went to church. But he was destroying his witness and destroying the witness of this church because of his actions. Now, let's just say it. We're not talking to anybody in here but somebody you know. <laughs> okay? I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. But please hear me. We've got to own what is ours. We've got to own it. And we've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't do this. I cannot live this holy Christian life without you. And in desperation, cry out to God. Now, hear me, please. If you're guilty of that, and let's face it, every one of us at some point or another has blown it. Okay, I have blown it. All the rest of you are holy, apparently. Yeah, thank you, finally. You know what you do when you blow it? You go to that person. So let's just put myself in the local factory, okay? And uh, I'm working with the machine, and I'm going as fast as I can. And I get my hand caught in that machine. That actually happened at first cafeteria. I was doing the dishwasher situation. Did you know that when those pots come out of the dishwasher, they are hotter than blitzing? And when you grab that pan, something miraculous happens. It grabs you. And you think that you can just do that. and You are attached for a moment. And so I'm sitting there staring at that thing while it's progressing towards this little bar right here. And I, I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, it starts to press this finger, and you can still see the scar. Look at that, Paris. I want you to have some sympathy here. Look at that. There's a scar, right? You see it, don't you? Yeah. And as Kyle would say, that's the cussing finger. So don't, don't just stick that finger up, okay? You've know, you got to send all the fingers with it, all right? Now. I got this thing, and it's got me, and it's pressing against that bar, and I'm going, and I'm trying to get somebody, and the, the, the little workmate with me, he, he does this. He goes, oh, <laughs> bam, he hits the button and uh, stops it. Well, now I'm attached to the whole cotton-picking machine. So, praise the Lord, I did not do what I'm trying to tell you that I, I could have done. But what, what if I would have just sat there and cussed an absolute blue streak as a preacher of the gospel. For one, not many people in that place would have held it against me because they see what I'm going through. But I can't control that. I can't control what they're thinking. Watch this. The only thing I can control is correcting a mistake. Remember, a man after God's own heart seeks to do the right thing. And a man after God's own heart does the right thing after he's done the wrong thing. And so if I would have done that, what I would have needed to do is go back to each one of those people that heard me and say, you just need to know, I, I failed. I failed. That, that's not the real me. The real me, and some of you have been with me when this has happened, the real me says praise the Lord when something like that happens. The real me cries out to God when something like that happens. Because the real me has been changed by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's who I really am. Occasionally, because of press, stress, pressure, stress, or whatever, I'll still do the wrong thing. And every time I do that, it's important that I do the right thing after I've done the wrong thing. If you and I We'll concentrate on this prayer. If we'll start tomorrow morning, and I'm not telling you that this has to be an everyday thing for you as much as it sure would be a wonderful tool in your toolbox for living a righteous life. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to thee. Oh God, desperation, my rock 
and my redemption. I think we're going to go a long way. Now, I said this to the first service. I love this. The best calling card that we have, church, is our changed life. That's the best calling card that we have to point to the cross. Let's all stand, musicians, will you come? Some of you are dying to know the rest of that story. It was the weirdest injury that I have ever had because of the heat of everything and the, the sterility of the whole environment. There was absolutely no blood. I could see my bone in the finger, and there was no blood. And I, I went to, because I'm thinking, man, i got to go have stitches, you know. And I go to the manager. You know what the manager said? Man, just put a Band-Aid on that. We need you to work. <laughs> I put a Band-Aid on it, and I got a beautiful little scar here. So uh, that's all right. If you're here today and you've never, ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is an invitation. We're inviting you to come forward. We'll send you with someone gender appropriate. You may just want to make this an old-fashioned altar and pray. Ask God to help you. Whatever the case may be, will you come? Let's sing.